Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to August. Welcome to the August Aging Well. And I guess it's the dog days of summer. But y'all know how I feel about dogs. You know, we have five. Um, so anyway, these are perfect days for me. And I just, as always, have to thank our team who work so hard putting everything together. So Tom Roth with our CTSI, Audrey Belfaro with our um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And you know, I always thank Courtney Hayes, but tonight I wanna say a little extra something about Courtney because last week she and her husband and big sister welcomed the newest member of their family, little Logan Hayes. So I just, I hope everyone who knows Courtney will hold her tight in their heart and think good things and say prayers for little baby Logan, but everyone's wonderful, doing great. And um, anyway, she said, she goes, I can't believe I'm going to be missing aging well. And I said, well, you have a pretty good excuse. So anyway, just know that, that she'd probably love to hear from anybody if y'all have her email. Um, so anyway, just thank you. Thank you for being here, for spending part of your Tuesday with us. We have got a great program set up for you tonight, and um, we're going to get started, first of all, with our cooking segment. Mark Groman is the owner and executive chef of the Meridian Restaurant, and I don't know if of those of you who live kind of in our area, in the greater Winston-Salem area, this is an award, nationally acclaimed award-winning restaurant. And he has been such a good friend to Aging Well. He actually did our very first cooking segment. So it was fun because so many of you have asked if he could come back. He was very gracious and is sharing with us a very healthy, um, easy recipe. And you will notice once again, I did not make any edits during the cooking demonstration part of this. Um, I did make one edit at the end because he forgot to say, come see me at the Meridian. So that was the only edit I make. So there's proof for you that this is a very easy and delicious recipe. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Deb. It's great to be back with Aging Well uh, after doing the first uh, episode. Um, it's nice to be back. We're gonna do something really simple again today. I've uh, got some really, really good North Carolina black grouper here. All we're gonna do is sear this in a pan finish it in the oven. I'm also going to show you how to do heirloom tomato and basil um, relish with it. Another super simple thing also makes, it's kind of like Italian bruschetta. Think of it that way. Everybody knows that word. So um, we're going to do that. A little roasted potatoes. Uh, you can do uh, roasted veg. If you're on the grill, you can grill this fish, grill the vegetables as well. Nice bright sauce. I'll walk you through that in a minute. Uh, this is really, really simple. All it requires is a really nice hot pan, a little bit of oil and butter, and salt and pepper. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Keep it clean. That's what we do here at Meridian Clean Cuisine. So let's get started. I'm gonna fire up this pan. The key is hot, hot pan. And I'll show you a trick to figure out how hot, how hot it needs to be. Uh, so simply just salt and pepper. I use kosher salt here. Pepper. Season both sides of your food. You don't want one side being jealous. Easy enough. Salt and pepper. And as far as the pan goes, just a little bit of oil. You're not frying this, right? So just a tiny bit of oil, a little bit of butter, you can hear it doing its thing. And right now the butter is bubbling. The way to tell that your pan is hot enough is when you don't see any bubbles in that butter and it starts to turn slightly brown. That's when you know you can put your fish in the pan without having it stick. I mean, if, if your fish sticks, you know your pan's not hot enough. Almost there. Simple, lightly browned, no more bubbles. 
fish pan easy give it a little shake to make sure it's not sticking always put the presentation side down which is the meat side not the skin side we use skinless fillets here we butcher our own fish take the skin off take the bones out uh, if you want to leave the skin on that's fine with grouper I would not recommend because the skin is really really thick not really edible so once that's going just leave it alone you know it's not sticking you'll be able to see it start turning slightly brown around the outside that kind of gives you an indication it's time to flip it over you're just looking for nice coloring on one side we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna finish this in the oven just to make sure um, that it's cooked all the way through so as you can see nice color flip it over little shake again and right into the oven and when I do this I'm gonna take these little potatoes I have here a little salt pepper herbs tiny bit of oil right in the oven with the fish easy as that now we're gonna work on this relish heirloom tomato or your favorite kind of tomato whatever you like obviously in the winter you're not gonna find these so just choose whatever you like. Tomato, dice them up. Put these in a little bowl. Now I have some shallots. <clears throat> little bit of shallots, little bit of garlic. Not too much. You still want to taste the tomatoes, not the garlic. Also, vinegar. Just for a pop of acidity and brightness, I use sherry vinegar. One of my favorites. You could use whatever you want. Red wine, even balsamic. It might look a little dirty on the plate, but balsamic and tomatoes go great together. So if you're not selling it, doesn't matter how it looks as long as it tastes good. A little bit of that. A little bit of good oil and at the end fresh basil and all we're gonna do is chop this up right in there all right a little bit of pepper a little bit of salt and the beauty of doing this at home is you can put as much or as little pepper and salt in there as you like if you're not supposed to have a lot of salt don't put salt in there it's your food And that's that. Quick, simple, easy, good flavors. Remember fresh, bright flavors. If you get good quality product, you're not gonna have to mess with it that much. And at this point, our fish and potatoes are done. Here's our fish, nice color, <clears throat> our potatoes, nice and hot. I'll show you how we would plate this here.
and a little bit of this good juice too. And that we would call seared black grouper, roasted sunshine tomatoes, and heirloom tomato basil relish. And that's it. Quick, simple, easy. And uh, you can do multiple pieces in the same pan. Remember that the whole key to this is a hot, hot pan. That's it. Uh, come see me at uh, Meridian Restaurant, 411 South Marshall Street. We're open Tuesday through Sunday starting at 430. Thanks again, everybody. Cook well. You know, it's always funny to me how um, I have to remind the chefs, hang on, to uh, invite people to come see them because, you know, they, all these chefs are doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're donating their time and um, in some cases donating the meal. So I can tell you from firsthand experience that this dish is amazing. And you might have noticed in the recipe he notes kind of after the fact that you can use any fish you want. You could even use a chicken breast if you wanted. And if you want to make the dish low carb, instead of doing the baby potatoes, you could steam some spinach and have the fish served over the spinach. So there are lots of kind of alternatives that you can use for this recipe, but it was absolutely delicious. I don't know that I've ever had black grouper before, but I'm going to have it again. So anyway, I just, I hope you enjoy it. And um, like he said, cook well. And he kept telling me, he goes, Deb, this is something even you could make. And I really do believe him that yes, I probably could make that. So I want to move on to our living well segment. And this is something that, once again, I have firsthand experience. When we move to Winston, or when Don and I live anywhere in the country, we just totally immerse ourselves in everything that area has to offer. And Winston was such a fun place to move to. And when I found out about Sawtooth School for Visual Arts, I just, I could not wait to get involved. Now, I'm not an artist. I don't think anyone who knows me would ever claim that I'm an artist, but that's what's so cool about Sawtooth is that there's something for everyone. And so the first class that I took was you could sculpt your dog out of clay. And again, we have five dogs, so I figured I had plenty of um, models to use, but it was such a fun class. And when I say I was a novice, I was a novice in the highest sense, I had no idea, I'd never taken a class before, but it didn't stop, didn't stop me from doing it and the instructor from welcoming me. And we just had so much fun. And in addition to me creating a little tiny, little tiny sculpture of my dog, it was fun. And that maybe was the greatest thing I got out of it was making so many new friends and just having a place where you could go and just relax and just kind of be. You get lost in the moment when you're working on whatever project. And so this was a special request I extended to Amy Jordan, who is the director of Sawtooth, if she would share a little bit of an overview of Sawtooth and some of the areas in which they offer classes. So anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. And again, think about this would be a fun, fun thing for, um, for us all to get involved in. Hi, Deb, and thanks for inviting Sawtooth to be a part of Aging Well. It's an honor to be a part of your audience and to tell them about Sawtooth School for Visual Art, which has been in here in Winston-Salem for seven, over 77 years. And in our school, we teach art that that is the crux of our school. It's for the community though. It's not an accredited school. It's actually a school that's for everyone. And we teach quality arts and crafts instruction. We include 11 different mediums, painting and drawing, textiles, printmaking, ceramics, glass, lapidary, metals, wood, photography, textiles, and youth. So the list is expansive. And in all of those mediums, 
We have everyone from beginner or novice to experienced, and experienced sometimes turn into our instructors. We have over 230 artists instructors from our community teaching here at Sawtooth. And we have in our gift shop, our Marta Blades gift shop, which is right behind me, we have 30 plus of our artists from the Sawtooth community exhibiting and selling their work here. Beyond that is our Davis Gallery, where we also exhibit about six times a year, different exhibits that focus on our community here at Sawtooth, but also the larger community and the, and the region itself. So Deb, come on in and join me and I'll show you the gift shop. Welcome to our Marta Blades gift shop. We have over 30 of our artists, instructors, and Sawtooth community exhibiting here in the gift shop and selling. This is a great opportunity for our community to show the work they've done and also to support them. So you'll see there's jewelry, there's ceramics, there's 2D, which is painting and drawing, printmaking, collage, there's bookmaking, there's glass, there's wood, and there's basketry. And I'd like to show you one of our artists, Gail Dula. Gail has been a part of our ceramics community for years. She has her own professional life. She is, lives out of town, but she comes into Sawtooth to do her ceramics. We've had her work here in the shop for years and she sells in our Sawtooth Artist Market, which is every December. She'll be back this year selling her work. So this is a platter by Gail Dula. This is a ceramics plate for our director, Seth Charles. We have many of his items. We have bowls. His work in the shop is functional, except for the piece that's over on the pedestal, which is a sculptural piece. And Seth is known for his sculptural work, especially in ceramics. So you'll see this is one of our jewelry cases here at Sawtooth, one of three. And we have multiple um, artists in metals who exhibit in our shop and sell in our shop. We have everything from bracelets to earrings to necklaces to brooches. Um, we have also different types of necklaces and earrings, every type of earring you could imagine. And a lot of these items, we also have glass by one of our artists. So this is a good example of some of the jewelry that's offered here, the rings. Wood is one of our popular mediums. Um, in, here at Sawtooth. As you can see, this beautiful cutting board that Josie Vogel did, our director of wood. Also, you see in the frame here, different types of furniture. We have a large dining table. We have occasional tables. These were all done by instructor artists here at Sawtooth. And then behind me, you also see more ceramics. And the thing that's great about everything you're seeing here in the shop, these are examples of classes you can take here at Sawtooth. These are examples of things that people have made. Everyone from novice to professional uh, works here in the different studios at Sawtooth and comes here to learn art and craft. We're now in our Marta Blades gallery. And in the gallery, we have about six exhibits per year. They're free to the public. And we encourage the public to come in because in this gallery space, we exhibit our, our community here at Sawtooth as well as outside of our community. Um, you're seeing now I'm standing in the midst of an exhibit called Bags of Sand. The artist you're seeing here is Julia Gartrell who uses repurposed materials for her sculptural work. It's just one of many different types of exhibits we have here at Sawtooth. And I hope you'll come join us in the gallery. And we have openings for each exhibit. I also wanted to tell you about some of the partnerships we have here in Winston-Salem and outside of the city. We work with about 30 different partners in the city. Some of those are art partners and some of them are in the medical field all over the community. One of those I wanted to point out is our, um, our partnership with Senior Services. Senior Services is building an intergenerational center that they've just broken ground on. And Sawtooth will have two studios there, a ceramic studio and a textile studio. This will be a great place for community to come and join us for the same kind of classes they here, have here at Sawtooth in a different setting, but the same type of instruction, high quality art and craft instruction. And that will be the Intergenerational Art Center through the Senior Services. That the directors and the staff here are a huge part of what you see happening every day. And I'm so grateful for their dedication as they work to, to present these programs for people like yourselves. 
And now I'd like to introduce you to two of those directors by video. I really enjoy sparkly things. I really, I love the transformation from the ugly to the really pretty. Well, I discovered metals in college. Uh, I had gone to college intending on being an art teacher, thinking drawing and painting was my gig, but I got introduced to metals in my freshman year and I just loved it ever since. Didn't even really know it existed as an art form but um, it, it just encompasses everything I like to do. There are really two distinct things I think that do inspire me to be in the metal studio and the first one is the process itself. I'm just in love with working with metal and as I said, taking it from A to Z and making beautiful things out of nothing. But the second part is also the camaraderie of the fellow artists and fellow students and like-minded people who love the same thing as I do. It's, uh, there's just people from all walks of life coming together and it's so fun to see all of our same enthusiasm for creating with metal. I moved to Winston-Salem from Iowa almost right out of college. It was a year after I finished Iowa State University and I just walked in and spoke with the really nice, really open, really welcoming people that were here at the school. And they were actually looking for a secretary. And I told them I had great secretarial skills I had hoped to not have to fall back on, but if that's what they needed, I'd love to get my foot in the door. They said, okay, fine, come back Monday and we will give you a trial for a week. And that was more than 30 years ago. And then within that first year also, the metals and glass coordinator retired. So I interviewed for and got that job. And that was really what I had hoped I could do eventually, was focus on my love of metals and being in the metals classroom and studio. I suppose metal has taught me just life lessons, sort of the perseverance sort of thing. Uh, don't give up until you see the end result and don't let anything sway you until you get to that end because you just don't know how it's gonna turn out until you, until you get there. What launched you into Let me see. It began with uh, letterpress printing. Just really like the idea of the multiple. It allows you to spread what you've made all over the place. You can plaster it all over the walls. You can give it away if you feel like it. <laughs> so I really like the idea that it allows so much chance for, for dispersing, dispersing the work. I'm finding more and more um, in my own work that I just have to learn and do whatever the project needs or whatever the project requires, rather than being an expert in linoleum cuts or an expert in wood cuts. It's like, no, this, this needs this kind of texture or this, it, this project needs this kind of ink, and so I just have to learn to use that to make the work to come to fruit. Printmakers really do enjoy community, and so the print group is um, this informal space to come together and talk ideas and talk about techniques. I also think, for me at least, it's in line with what I consider to be the ethics of craft, which is that the knowledge is meant to be shared um, and is not meant to be hoarded, and so it's a chance to, to exercise that, and people can come forward and, and offer their expertise and share the knowledge they have. I find it also pretty easy to collaborate with printmaking. A friend and I did a project where I would print and then pass her the prints and then she would print on them and then we'd pass them back and forth that way and each morning I would come to the press and there the stack would be of what we had done and I would add my bit and then pass it off to her and she would add her bit. It really is ideas about um, what it is to be a human being and, and experience life. I really enjoy um, operating on a different, a different system of time, what I consider to be artist's flow, where you lose track of time and you are just immersed in the work itself. I'm just wanting to see what if I add this and then print and what if I add that and then print and then you just start to, then the, the train starts moving. Just following each movement and each uh, necessary technique after the next and then five hours have gone by and you didn't even realize it. That's the part I love. So it's nice to have an opportunity to tell you more about Sawtooth and give you an overview. 
I'll just say that there's so many stories that live here. There's so many stories that live within Sawtooth because we've been here for so long and that's probably been my favorite part of being executive director here at Sawtooth is hearing your stories. It really is so much fun to take those classes and it's, it's a welcoming place. You, you go in there and, and you just share what you know, what you don't know, but all of us bring a different perspective to whatever class we're taking. And I don't know about you, but man, that metal work sure looks interesting. So that may be the next thing I check out. And I will tell you on the follow-up information that we send following Aging Well, um, I will have their website on there because they no longer do a printed newsletter that goes out, but all of that is found on their website. So just know you will be getting some more information, the details, if you do want to get involved. And who knows, maybe we'll be in the same class together. So when I came to Wake seven plus years ago now, one of the first people I met is still one of my favorite people that I've gotten to work with and, and really be friends with. And that woman is Dixie Yao. She is phenomenal. She is the senior clinical dietitian. We worked together on so many projects, including our food distribution program that, that we worked on during the ultimate lockdown of COVID. But, you know, Dixie and I talk from time to time and she is just a wealth of information on practical, wonderful things that she can share to help us all age well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dixie and remind y'all, if you have questions for her, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, because we'd like to make sure we get all your questions answered. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Dixie Yao. Well, thanks, Deb. I appreciate that. All right. We, um, I, I, I'm excited to do this. Um, you know, as Deb said, you know, I, I look at things in a practical way. I want things to be easy and simple and not have to work too hard on anything um, and make it fun. And so when she asked me to do this segment about the, um, about this, the seasoning or making good healthy foods taste better, I thought, well, you know, that's a fun idea. So oh, we're going to try that out. So let me share my screen here. All right. Okay. Um, but, you know, healthy food does not have to be boring. And I hear that all the time. You know, you're telling me to eat these vegetables and you're telling me to eat this fish and this fruit, but they just aren't as it's just not tasty. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. You can actually make good food taste good. So, you know, does this look like you? Do you feel like at mealtime that you are just like, oh, I am so tired of this bland food. I don't know what to eat, but this is what my doctor told me I had to eat. And I just don't know how to eat it because I'm tired of it. And so, you know what? You might want to spice it up some. So let's work on that a little bit. All right. What are the I will first want to talk about what the basics of healthy eating are, um, because I do think that eating healthy is extremely important as a dietitian. Of course, I feel that way. And I also feel that you need to understand what steps we're going towards when we're trying to make our healthy foods taste better. And most of these um, suggestions here actually came from the Blue Zone. And I think they're very important. So the first one is eat less red meat. It doesn't mean you can't ever eat red meat. We just don't want you to eat it every night. We want you to limit it a little bit. Limit refined sugar and processed foods. So it doesn't mean natural sugar that comes in fruit. This is the refined sugar that we use to sweeten foods with. And then processed foods, anything in a box or, you know, basically that's already all put together and, you can microwave it or you can just open up a package and start eating it. A lot of those things have a lot of salt in them and a lot of fat and they have no nutrition. We want to choose more whole ingredients when you can. So when you can eat or choose fruit, fresh fruit, you can choose, you know, fresh fish, fresh vegetables and those types of things is so much better. But I know we can't always do that. One, they're pricey. Two, they're not always available. Um, there is, you know, so just when you can, and of course, I wouldn't go without telling you to eat lots of fruit and vegetables. We want you to eat a ton of fruit and vegetables, especially the vegetables, and also choose whole grain starches. 
A lot of folks try to cut out carbs because they're so unhealthy, but carbs really are not our enemy. It's the type of carbs we eat and it's how much of them we eat. So we want to choose whole grains, but eat them in moderation. Brown rice, 100% whole wheat bread, barley, um, you know, oatmeal, anything like that. We also, and I, I tell anybody that I talk to that they should be eating some type of beans every day. Those dried beans should be eaten a little bit every day. All you need is a half a cup. But dried beans, if you buy them dry in the grocery store, they're probably the, one of the cheapest things that you can buy in the grocery store that has more nutrition than anything else there. They're full of antioxidants. They're full of, they got protein in them. They're full of fiber and they're very filling. And all the nutrition that's in those beans, we really need to make sure we, we try to get those in. But also too, we want to use, you know, increase the use of spices and herbs for the taste and health. And in the blue zone, that was one of the comments that a lot of herbs and spices actually have healthy nutritional properties. And they feel like that that is part of what's helping them. Now, so let's talk a little bit about spice it up. In this slide, I know you're going to be so thrilled that I, I, I told you this because I know you've always wondered what the difference between a spice and a herb is. But spices and herbs enhance the flavor. They make this, they then even make the food smell good. They make it look better um, without adding fat and salt and calories and sugar. These things can be sweet. They can be smoky. They can be hot, spicy, tangy. There are so many different flavors out there. And like I said early, many, many of them do have antioxidant properties. And so the best way to do it is add it to your whole foods when you're cooking. Now, spice is a seasoning made of dried seeds, okay, and bark. Herb is any plant with any with fleshy parts that are used for brewing tea, seasoning, foods, or medicine. And they're both from plants. And that's the part I know you're just really so glad I cleared up for you, the difference between an herb and a spice. Um, so let's keep moving. All right. Um, there are a lot of spices out there. There are a lot of herbs out there. And I like to keep it simple. I don't want to keep my pantry too full with uh, herbs and, and seasonings because sometimes they will go bad on me, but two, I get confused about what I, I need to be using. Um, so I try not to keep it too terribly full, but I try to get as much as I can that I like. And, you know, the original Italian herbs like your basil, oregano, and thyme, I mean, of course, you've got to have those. And I love to season foods with fruit. I love to use lemon, especially with fish, lime, orange, and the zest of all of those fruits. Very delicious. And I'm gonna show you a recipe in a minute that I actually use the orange and the zest. And I, and I have made a sweet potato, a healthy sweet potato casserole using just a little bit of orange juice and the zest of an orange, absolutely delicious. Everybody knows about garlic. If you're a garlic fan, you know that you can, have garlic fresh, you can get it in the jar, you can use powdered garlic. We just don't want the, we don't want the garlic salt, we want the garlic powder. Um, but you can also use the sauces and dressings and on vegetables. You know, I love to heat it up and just let it, you know, just let the foods absorb the flavor of it. But as the chef said earlier, be careful, you want to taste the food not just the garlic. Onions can be dry, they can be raw. I love to caramelize them in a pan, um, just to caramelize them a little bit on the heat to make them a little bit sweeter. Uh, hot sauces and peppers. I don't like hot spicy foods, but I do use a lot of hot sauce and I do use a lot of peppers. You can use just enough without getting the spiciness, but it gives you this nice tangy flavor. And then balsamic vinegar is another one that's always in my pantry. And I do love it on my tomatoes. Um, you know, my husband says, why do you make our tomatoes brown? Well, it's because I'm using brown balsamic vinegar or purple, but it's great for salad dressings and marinades. Many people use turmeric with beans. I get that question all the time. How should I cook my beans? And this is one thing, you could put a little turmeric in there. And ginger is wonderful with dressings. I love to put it in different marinades and make your own ginger tea. And rosemary is something I like with chicken. And I will tell you, if you grow rosemary, and I'm a, rosemary is the easiest thing to grow because I don't have a green thumb and I can grow some rose, rosemary. But what I like to do is I like to go pick some of the, and cut some of the strongest stalks and I'll take the, the rosemary leaves off of it. And I take those stalks 
and I used those as skewers on my little chicken bits and put them on the grill. And that rosemary flavor just gets infused in that chicken and it's delicious. Now, now I typically will take a real skewer and put holes in the chicken so I don't break that rosemary stalk. But that's a wonderful way uh, to grill your chicken or you could even do it in the oven that way if you wanted to. Some people are looking for something sweet. You know, you can add cinnamon, nutmeg, or ginger to make things taste a little sweeter. They don't taste like sugar, but it just gives you that little little nudge that you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for something to use in vanilla foods, use nutmeg. Nutmeg is wonderful in a lot of different things. And I mentioned lemon with fish earlier. Um, when I make marinades, I use all kinds of vinegars. I use fruit juices. And then I start adding whatever seasonings I'm, I look for, any seasonings that I'm in the mood for. And it may depend on what I'm cooking to, for, to, to marinate or what I plan on marinating in there. But I use a lot of, you know, I love paprika, oh, chili powder, garlic, basil, you name it. They're all good in any type of marinade. But keep in mind that dried herbs do pack dried herbs and spices pack a, a bigger punch than fresh. So if you're gonna use, if the recipe, if you're using a recipe and it calls for fresh, but you don't have fresh and you wanna use the dried, you will only use about a third of what you would use of the fresh because it does pack a bigger punch and you don't wanna overwhelm your food. We just wanna make it taste better. We don't wanna overwhelm it. But let me tell you, the options are limited limitless. There are so many different options out there. And as I was doing a little research for this presentation, I was finding out about herbs and spices I've never even heard of. And we have plenty of herb and spice stores around here. Um, that, so I'm so excited to get out and maybe try some other ones. Um, other ways to spice things up without just using, you know, individual herbs and spices. One of the things that I've started using recently is coconut aminos. And I use that in place of soy sauce. Coconut aminos is gluten-free and it's soy-free. So if you're allergic to either one of them, that's a good thing. Um, they have, it's actually lower in sodium. So when you use these coconut aminos, you only need a small amount because it gets pretty, gets pretty strong pretty quickly. So start out with small amounts and add as you need, if you feel like you need more. Now, the thing I will tell you about buying coconut aminos, just like anything else you're gonna buy in the store, look at the label because some of these coconut aminos can have more salt than soy sauce. You want to make sure you buy the lowest. And so I make sure I buy the ones that don't have any more than 50 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon. And the one I have pictured here is actually a picture of the one I have at home, and it has 25 milligrams of sodium in a teaspoon. Now, soy sauce has between 190 and 360 roughly milligrams of sodium per teaspoon. But when you look on the label of soy sauce, it gives you the sodium in a tablespoon, which you're gonna see, you know, uh, over 400, over a thousand sometimes. And, but the coconut aminos, there are serving sizes in a teaspoon. So that's why I put it this way on the slide so you can compare. And guess what? If you're not ready to start experimenting, you know, sometimes you're just like, I just want something just to put on my food. I, you know, I don't wanna have to figure out what goes well with what. Um, choose some spice mixes. Choose some mixes that are already there, but look for the low sodium. Um, you know, the Dash makes some, uh, McCormick's makes some, uh, even Kirkland's, I think that, they, you know, Sam's has some, Lowry's, I mean, they're everywhere. And when we used to have the store here in town, the, um, the chef store, um, I can get any of these. And it's a little bit harder to buy some of these. So I do order a lot of them. And I'm sure most of us have gotten used to ordering things since COVID started. And, um, but I do like pre-mixed herb spice mixes because some of it just do, it does make things easier um, and take some of the thinking out of it. And another thing too is I grew up where my food was cooked very Southern and was extremely high in salt and fat, um, but all our vegetables were so cooked that they were just, I don't know, they're just stringy. I mean, it was just, it was, it was you, you you just, they slither down your throat. Um, I have learned to roast vegetables and I've learned that if I put the right seasonings on it, it definitely, it just makes that vegetable taste so much better. And I don't feel like I'm eating slimy vegetables anymore. Now, other ways to spice things up, 
You can cook vegetables. So if you're cooking vegetables in a pan on the stove, or if you're cooking absorbent starches like brown rice or barley, use unsalted chicken broth or unsalted beef broth or stock and use that instead of the water. That, it is delicious. And I buy frozen lima beans. My husband and everybody says these just don't have any flavor. So I started cooking them in the chicken broth, the unsalted chicken broth. And now, you know, I, I, they keep asking me, when are you going to cook those, those lima beans again? So it does work. But also keep in mind that when you're looking for these low sodium salt, uh, low sodium, low salt broths and stocks, the only thing that means low sodium or no sodium is the words unsalted or no. Okay, now you can find low. Low also means low sodium, but you're not going to see that on your broths. But you need to make sure it's unsalted or no. Reduced sodium does not mean it's low in sodium. So just keep that in mind. But another thing you can do too is use recipes that already use seasonings in place of salt. And I've got a couple of cookbooks at the end here I'm going to recommend that do that. They don't, they, you don't use much salt. They use more herbs and spices to flavor their food. Now, one of my favorite ways to cook, and especially if you're just cooking for one or two, you might really like this. It's even when I'm cooking for four, it's great. But I love to do sheet pan meals. I will put some aluminum foil on a pan, spray it down with a cooking spray, and I'll put my protein and my vegetables all on the same tray and cook it all at once. And typically what I'll do is I have the vegetables in it. I, put, I like to put them in a bowl put my, with just a tiny bit of olive oil. I keep olive oil on a spray bottle. So I spray it real lightly just so the herbs and spices will stick to it. And then I toss it and then I put them out on the pan. Um, and it's a great way too, if you got picky people because you can cook different vegetables and everybody can pick out whatever they like. And, um, but using those herbs and spices with, with all of it, it's just, it's so good. And, and, you know, every time I ask somebody, every time I get close to a chef, somebody that's a really good cook, I always ask them, what do you season this with? What do you season that with? They all have different answers. Okay. So just keep in mind, it's what you like, what you like and what you want. There'll be some things you'll know not to put, you know, not to put cinnamon with shrimp, which somebody recently told me they did that by mistake. Um, you know, certain things like that you won't do. Another way I like to cook and use in my herbs and spices, especially my fresh, are foil or parchment paper packets. I love my packet cooking. I use foil just because it's easier, you know, foil closes up because when you put, you're gonna put, you're gonna spray it real lightly with a cooking spray. You're gonna put your veggies down, season them. That's where I love to put my fresh herbs. Then I put my protein down on top of it, season that again. And sometimes, depending on what it is, I might even put a slice of lemon in there with it. But when you when you bring that oil or parchment paper up, you want to make sure it's sealed so no air gets out of it. So part, you know, oil is just easier to do that. But you don't. But you want to make sure there's room at the top for the air to circulate. So you don't want it tight. You want to have room at the top. And great way to make foods eat, uh, uh, taste good, but it's also quick. It's easy. There's very little cleanup. And I many times will make uh, packets, put them in the refrigerator. Then the next day when I get home, I just throw them in the oven. And I, I love fish. I eat fish every day, but my family will not. So I make myself fish packets with the same vegetables that they're getting chicken packets. And I don't have to feel like I'm cooking two different meals. And that works out really well too. I have known people to put potatoes and rice in their packets. The problem with that is it takes a lot longer for those to cook and it, it, it you, you end up overcooking your vegetables and your protein most of the time. Keep in mind guys, if it, the, the prettier the plate, the better tasting the meal. And I, I think most of you would agree with me. Uh, you may not even be hungry, but you see this most you know attractive looking meal that you're thinking, I, I gotta have that. I, I need that. Uh, use different colors, use different textures. You know, if you have potatoes and you have black eyed peas and you have, you know, chicken, it's all brown, right? It's no fun. You want, and it's not very appetizing. So of course you want to try to use different colors, use different textures, try to get as many fruits and vegetables into some of these things. And of course the spices that you like. Um, now, 
add some, what makes it pretty too, is if you take some of those herbs, especially your leafy ones, and you put them on the top right after it's done cooking. And if you've ever noticed that, they do that at restaurants all the time. Have you ever had to pull that sprig of whatever it may be out, out of your fish or your chicken and you see all this really pretty green spices on top or herbs on top and it just makes it look more appetizing. And I will tell you that the picture here on the bottom left is from one of my study participants. He told me I could use this. It's a salad that he made with lots of fruits and nuts. And I think he said he used a, a low calorie poppy seed dressing in there. And it looks delicious. And then the, the picture on the far right, the big one, is another study participant. She sent me that this picture. And you know, I look at that and it just makes me want tomatoes and shrimp and spinach and asparagus immediately. Um, I want to go home and cook that meal. And um, and then of course, you know, you've got your your chicken on top of vegetables, you've got fish with your vegetables and your starch, if you're gonna eat a starch. Um, you know, and it just makes things look so much better that it tastes better. Use a plate that's proportional to the food, meaning you don't want to have a plate that's just overwhelming with food. Because when you get a plate that's so full of food, it may look pretty, but you're going to look at it and say, there's no way I can eat all of this. Or if you have a big plate and you put it in and you put a regular portion, but it looks very tiny in the middle, you're going to look at it and you're not, you're going to feel like, I'm not full after eating this. I want more. So try to use a plate that's proportional to the food that you're going to eat. And that actually helps with your appetite. Okay. Don't be afraid to experiment. I am one of these folks that when I look at recipes and I don't have an ingredient, I think, well, what else could I use in place of that? Even if it's a you know, spice or an herb, I will look and say, what can I use in place of that? And I have my little round spice rack and I'm going to go around and find what I like. And um, if you're using dried herbs, like I said, they pack a bigger punch. So you don't have to put a whole lot. You just, they, they actually give a lot of flavor. Now, robust herbs can withstand longer cooking. And tender herbs don't hold up to a long cooking time. The reason I'm telling you that is your robust herbs. Think about cinnamon sticks or even um, cloves, um, cumin seeds, you know, any, any, you know, celery seeds, things like that. They're robust. So they can stay, you, you might want to put them in the cooking earlier, but if they're tender, like little leaves and, you know, using cilantro or parsley or even basil, you don't want to put them in too early because the longer you cook them, the less flavor they'll have. So you don't want to, you know, you want to put them in the last five minutes or so of cooking. And um, I will tell you that spices and herbs can be very expensive, but if you think about it, you look at that bottle and you think, I might have to buy to spend that much for that. But if you think about it, how many meals are you going to get out of a bottle? You know, a four ounce bottle of these spices and herbs. You're probably going to get a lot of meals out of it. So I wouldn't be too afraid of that. But if you're just learning to experiment with spices and herbs, I would buy the ones that are less expensive um, just until you feel more comfortable and ready to branch out a little bit. And um, if you're cooking something, you're doing a really quick cooking dish, you might want to crush the herbs before you add it in there um, because that'll make the oils and, and the flavors come out and you'll get more of it in the dish because if you don't do that and you cook it quickly, a lot of that flavor isn't going to come out there. But this is what I do. If I don't know what to use or if I don't have a specific herb or spice and a recipe calls for it, I go to the web, I Google it and say, okay, I've got this chicken and I don't know what, and, and I'll just put best herbs and spices with baked chicken breast. And they'll give me a list and I'll look, see what I have, or what spice or herb can I use in place of such and such. And I find, I find that the web really helps me a lot because you're, you're getting information from people that do a lot of cooking, that know what they're doing most of the time. And I, you get a lot of good information from there. So I, I do Google a lot when I'm cooking. And you know, I told you, I don't follow recipes typically. I just throw a little of this, a little of that. And if I don't have that, then I find something else to put in place of it. All right, we're gonna do it a recipe exchange. Somebody gave me this um, tomato soup recipe, said, oh, this is wonderful, you're gonna love it. Um, it has only has three ingredients and it's so easy. 
And I was looking at it, and this has been a few years, and it, you know, it does call for four tablespoons of butter, you know, one 28 ounce can of tomatoes, one and a half cups of chicken stock, and a teaspoon of salt. Now, let me back up here. A teaspoon of salt has about 2,400 milligrams of sodium and a teaspoon of salt. So you're gonna divide that by four, okay? That's still 600 milligrams of sodium, right? But then um, we don't need more than 1,500 to 2,400 milligrams of sodium in a whole day. And that one teaspoon will take it up for you if you're adding a teaspoon to a serving of something. Um, so, you know, when I looked at this, I thought, you know, this may be good, but I don't think I want to make it this way because in one cup of it, I'm going to be getting about 700, close to 750 milligrams of sodium. That's either half or a third, basically, of what I should have in a whole day. And almost everything we eat is going to have a little bit of sodium in it, even if it's natural. But I have this chunky vegetable, this tom tomato vegetable soup that I really love, and I use it in place of this three ingredient tomato soup. So what I did, you're gonna think this is crazy, but a half cup of rolled oats, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but just a little bit of olive oil or canola oil, because we know that's very heart healthy. I'm gonna make it a little chunky. I'm gonna add some more uh, vegetables to it to give it more flavor and a little texture to it. So I'm gonna cut up, finely chop up a medium onion. I'm gonna cut up or chop up a carrot and I'm gonna put two cloves of garlic in there. But instead of just using regular vegetable juice, I'm using two cups of low sodium to, to vegetable juice. So this makes it quick and easy. You can make your own, and I have many times, but I don't always have good fresh tomatoes to make my own. So I would use, I use the tomato juice. Some people look at me and I said, you can get the low sodium, it's no problem. And then I put my favorite spice, my favorite herb, is basil. I could just eat it off the plant. I'd love it so much. And then some uh, pepper. But also, instead of using just regular chicken broth, I'm using unsalted chicken broth. So I have actually made this recipe have more ingredients, add more flavor to it, and it's only about 200 milligrams of sodium per serving per one cup. That's a big difference between these two. And I guarantee you, you will like this one better, the chunky one better, because it's just more fun. It's got more color to it, more texture to it. But the rolled oats is my favorite part. So I take those oats, only a half a cup, you don't need a lot. And I put them in a skillet. On, in, in on warm temperature and I toast them. I keep stirring them and I toast them and I toast them, um, but, and I take them out right before they burn because if they burn, throw it away, start over, okay? Because they're not any good. But you wanna put them on the side while you make your soup. But when you put that those toasted oats in this soup and you stir it up, oh my goodness, it adds this nutty flavor to it. So there's another way to spice up your food, right? And you're using oatmeal, which is good for you. And most people do have raw oatmeal at home that they can use. And um, you know, if you don't want to do that, you could probably cook a little brown rice and put in there if you wanted to, or you would, don't have to put it, any of it in there if you don't want to. Um, but I, and I know that the, the writing on here is kind of small, but you know, I wanted to get it all on one side because I wanted you to see the difference between the two. And even though the one, the chunky tomato vegetable soup has more ingredients, it's actually just as quick to make. It doesn't take that long to make at all. And it's absolutely delicious. So I've got another recipe that I want to exchange. And this is salmon. Salmon's one of my favorites. Uh, you know, I recommend that you eat fish as often as you feel like you, you like it. I mean, I could eat it every day, um, but at least once or twice a week. Uh, I highly recommend fish, all types of fish, whether it's a fat-free white filet or it's a, a, a healthy fat salmon, tuna, sardine, something like that. Um, but you should be eating a little bit more fish. So somebody, when I first started working here, oh, actually I wasn't working here, I was working in Virginia. That was my first job after graduate school. And I had never, I, I was up near Virginia Beach and I grew up thinking the only way you could eat fish was fish that came out of the pond and it had been battered and cornmeal and fried. So I never liked fish. I never you know, learned to eat fish because of that. And I moved up there and I ordered a, a, tuna, a tuna sandwich thinking I'm getting tuna salad. And I got a hamburger bun with lettuce, tomato and tuna steak on it. 
I had no idea. And it was the best thing I'd ever had. So at the hospital where I was working, I was asking the chefs, hey, how do I cook this? How do I cook that? I mean, I was really working on these, these fish. And this is the first recipe I got. It was at, for, just for four you know, fillets of salmon. And that's about um, four ounces each, two teaspoons of salt, pepper, and olive oil. Now, remember what I said, a teaspoon of salt is about 2,400 milligrams of sodium. You'd multiply that times two, then divide it by four servings, and you're getting about 1,200 milligrams of sodium in one uh, serving. And, you know, I got this recipe. I was just out of graduate school. We didn't have food labels. We didn't have the internet, you know, and I was just learning. And then I realized I don't need that much salt. But I grew up eating a lot of salt. And so I've had to learn over time. But I have learned the herbs and spices and, and fruits and just so many things can make food taste so much better than salt. But I switched this salmon recipe out for a spiced salmon, a sweet spiced salmon that I actually got from American Heart Association. The Go Red for Women, they had a little pamphlet that we, that in my department where I was working at the time, we passed out. And I said, I'm gonna try this recipe. Well, guess what? It calls for grated orange zest. I mentioned that earlier. It calls for a little bit of orange juice, a little bit of lemon juice. It already sounds great. You've got your fish. It does call for a little bit of brown sugar. It's not that much when you divide it between four servings and most of it's gonna stay in the marinade. So you're not gonna, you know, when you take the fish out, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. But here comes my herbs and spices. I got paprika, I got curry powder. And guess what? I don't like curry powder. I do not like curry, but it's wonderful on this recipe. It's amazing how you can make things taste different with different foods. Um, cinnamon, who would have thought of putting cinnamon on their salmon? Not me. And then a little bit of cayenne pepper. And what's so great about the cayenne pepper is it, that little tiny bit just gives it a little kick. It's not spicy at all, but it's a sweet spice salmon. And in this, in one serving, you're only getting about 350 milligrams of sodium versus the 1200 milligrams of sodium. And this one just tastes so much better and it is wonderful. And I actually had done a cooking class at Forsyth Tech for a while. And each session, I use this recipe. And out of all the recipes we cook, everybody loved this recipe the most. So I encourage you to try it if, um, if you like salmon. But adding all these herbs and spices really do help. All right, the last page, I've got some helpful resources for you. The first one is from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And it actually gives you, if when you go on there, it gives you a list of um, what types of herbs and spices go well with what meats and vegetables. So that's a great way if you're not used to it, not sure what to do. Um, you can go to the Mecklenburg um, Cooperative Extension Agency, which is really just the North Carolina version. Um, and they give you all kinds of information on growing herbs, but also eating herbs and how to use it. And then eatright.org. If you go to this website, they will give you more information on how to add herbs and spices to your food to make it taste better and, and, and come out right. And I've got three books I'd like to recommend. Um, the first one is a complete book of herbs, a practical guide for growing and using herbs. So you don't have to grow them, but you know you can. Or, but it's also just using them. I love the American Heart Association, the low salt book has just been revised. And then um, the Blue Zones cook, uh, cook book that I had mentioned, the Blue Zones earlier with the healthy eating uh, properties. And this Blue Zones kitchen cookbook is really good too. So I hope you'll be able to you know, look at some of these um, and get some good information from all of this. And I imagine there are some of my friends out there that um, I have, I don't know who's out there. So if you want to send me a little uh, wave or something you can but otherwise I think I've got like two minutes left for questions right Deb and then we can go a little bit longer because okay. my friend you have gotten a ton of questions in oh so, okay well I hope I can answer them <laughs> well you know what I bet you can so I am going to just be reading some of okay. them and so one person wants to know do lentils count as beans yes they do and they're my favorite Oh, there you go. And you can cook them very quickly. It only takes about 20 minutes to cook them. Okay. So they have Dixie, the most protein too. Sorry. Oh, good to know. 
So this question is Dixie, a recent issue of Consumer Reports had an article about safety concerns with dried seasonings, including those that are grown organically. Of course, it would be great if we could all grow our own seasonings, uh -huh. but it's just not possible without the right conditions. Do you have any advice great. about purchasing spices? When I purchase spices, I try to go with the brands I know. The ones in the grocery store that I know that I've used, you know, my mother used that brand. You know, I grew up, you know, with that brand and I try to go with those. Um, you're right. It would be nice if we could all grow our own, but, you know, we're not right. And I have seen some of those concerns. All of those concerns have not truly been validated at this point. Um, so we'll just keep watching that. I continue to use the herbs because it's still better than processed foods is still better than a lot of salt and a lot of fat and a lot of butter, you know, those types of things. So we have a question, why or how does dried versus natural herbs pack a better punch? Seems as if fresh would have more of a punch. It does, it does. But you think about anything that's been dried, it shrinks, okay? So it shrinks and when you shrink something and you pour it into a spoon, you're getting a lot more in that little teaspoon than you would if you just tore up a few leaves of an herb and they do give you a whole lot more flavor and that's just because for that reason being dehydrated and they're sharp but i do know from from my experience with my husband who is our cook mm -hmm. is that you really have to watch the expiration dates on a lot of those dried and mm -hmm. because they just they lose their flavor and then they you don't do. understand why you're not getting the same benefit from mm -hmm. it yeah my my thing is if i open it up and i don't smell it smell the herb then i know for sure i need to get and oh. get some new ones and again you know when i said if you don't want to buy the expensive ones if you start buying the expensive ones you know make sure you're going to buy the ones you use and going to be able to use up and sometimes i will share a bottle with my neighbor we'll split a bottle and that way we're cutting the cost and we know we won't have any leftover that go bad. So what about vegetables? Are frozen preferable over canned? Yes. Frozen is always preferable over canned. Although you can get no salt added canned vegetables. But in the process, you are losing a little bit of that nutrition. Although canned, no salt added would be better than nothing. Okay. Uh, but fresh and frozen is going to be the best way to go. Frozen usually is harvested and frozen immediately. I mean, frozen right after it's harvested. So it's frozen while all the good nutrients are just really strong. Whereas with the fresh, you got to take time to get to the grocery store, take time, you know, with all the different steps. And then the canned, it's processed. And so some of the nu nutrients do come out of it. So how much is a serving of vegetables? Good question. If it's a leafy green, like a lettuce, or if you're going to eat it raw, leafy green, spinach, or anything, it's one cup. But if you're going to cook it, any leafy greens, it's a half a cup. And any other vegetable, whether you cook it or not, is a half cup serving. And I encourage folks to eat at least six servings of vegetables a day. Okay. So, and then the same person wants to know how much is a serving of beans for some beans daily. How much yeah. would you recommend? Yeah, um, half a cup. Okay. If you can just get a half a cup into your diet, you're getting 10 grams of fiber. You know, you're getting, you know, uh, at least seven grams of protein, seven or eight grams of protein. You're getting all of these vitamins and minerals, the antioxidants that you need. And that's really, I mean, if you want to eat more, you can. But beans also pack a lot of calories. So you don't want to go overboard. So if you want to try to, you know, at least get a half a cup in. And that's what I do every day is just a half a cup. May throw them on a salad, may eat them as is, may put them in a soup, stew, something like that. Okay. So then I don't quite understand this question. Are there no tomatoes in the soup? So no, no, that's the thing about this soup. If you want to, though, you can get you a good can of chopped tomatoes or, yeah, you know, I make this soup in the wintertime. So I don't have good tomatoes and the grocery store tomatoes aren't worth cutting and putting in a soup because they have no flavor at that time. But if you want to get a good can of soup, I mean, can of chopped tomatoes, no salt added, you can dump that in there, too. Okay, but you still need the juice to, get, to give it its, you know, we're kind of looking for that tomato soup texture. Yeah, well, I can actually answer the next two questions because the question is, will we get copies of Dixie's recipes? 
And yes, you will. <laughs> they will be included. This whole presentation is included in the follow-up uh, that you will receive either Wednesday or Thursday from me. And then the other question is, is this presentation available for us to review later? And yes, um, what we do, and, and for those of you, because I think we have quite a few new people tonight, so welcome. But what I do after every program of Aging Well, I almost said episode, I don't know if it's considered an episode, but I follow up with both all the handouts that my speakers would have referenced during that edition of Aging Well. So yes, you will get all of Dixie's slides, her recipes, as well as information. You'll get a, you know, a final copy of the, the cooking demonstration, as well as information on Sawtooth School for Visual Arts. You'll get all that in the follow-up. But maybe the coolest thing is you get a link to the actual, to this presentation that is on the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist website and more so than just being able to go back and watch this episode, most everyone we've ever done is archived there. So you can also go back and look at, maybe you missed one or two. I can't imagine anyone would have ever missed one. <laughs> but if you did, maybe you were, you know, scuba diving in Bora Bora and you missed an aging well, you can go back and watch that. And you can also watch some of the ones for the presentations if you want to see them again. So yes, yes, yes to those questions. And thank you for asking, giving me that chance to respond. Okay, another question is, what is health value to stewed cabbage and also boiled corn on the cob? What is the health value of stewed cabbage and corn on the cob? Yes. Well, cabbage, again, gives you all kinds of vitamins and minerals. Um, I encourage the darker, the better. So, you know, red or purple would have more nutrition than the green. Um, if you stew anything too long, though, you are, you're not getting, uh, some of those vitamins and minerals will end up in the water. So you want to make sure you, know, you don't stew it for too long. And boiled corn is a starch. It's got lots of fiber in it. And you do get vitamins and minerals. And I think it's very healthy. It's just one, like I said, you know, we're afraid of carbs. We're afraid of eating bread and any other starches, but they're not our enemy. It's what we eat and how much of it we eat. And corn is very healthy. So I encourage people to eat corn. Just, you know, don't eat five, you know, stops. Years of it. Yeah. Years, thank you. So another, and this is a great idea. Ooh. I don't have brown sugar, but sometimes I've substituted with stevia and it's worked. Mm -hmm. Love this presentation. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's great. I, that's a good suggestion. It really is. Like I said, the you know options are limitless. Mm -hmm. There are so many things out there, and I can talk for days and still not give you, you know, all the options and ideas that I would have. But I think replacing any type of sweetener with this stevia, and mm -hmm. and, and I know that. You know, you may not want to use large quantities of it, but occasionally, I, you know, I think everything right. may be moderation. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, you don't have to give up everything you love and you just have to learn to eat things and like you said, in moderation, not as often. You know, we've all gotten used to having dessert after every meal. Well, you know, when I was growing up, you might get dessert once a month, once a week, you know, and now we're having it every night, you know, and that kind of thing. And just so moderation is is key and that was part of the blue zones i was reading was you know they just eat foods in moderation mm -hmm. um, well and be mindful about yeah. what you're eating this is something you and mm -hmm. i have talked about is that yeah. you know when you're eating be in the moment really mm -hmm. be savoring the look of your food enjoying the conversation don't my goodness, don't just be watching TV reading <laughs> book or doing something else. Because, or on the phone. Yeah, doing all that because, you know, you're going to eat more mm -hmm. and you're not going to savor it and enjoy it as much as if you're truly in the moment. That is true. Well, I want to respond to this question, but we've already answered it. How to know when spices and herbs expire. Yeah. I think it's a smell test, right? Yeah, they say that the dried ones in the bottles can last up to three years. I've, I've never had any of my leafy ones like parsley and any of those last more than a year. Um, but again, if you open it up and you don't stay, you don't smell it, and, and you know, then you know you're not going to get any flavor from it. 
Yeah. Well, you know what? You have blasted through all the questions and okay. I want to thank the attendees for those thoughtful questions that you ask because I always learn as much in the Q&A as I do the actual presentation. Yeah. And Dixie, I just want to thank you again for sharing this with us, for being a part of Aging Well. And yes, all of Dixie's great information is going to be coming to you either Wednesday or Thursday from me. So be watching for it and um, make a date with me on September 13th. But I actually need to clarify that on yeah. September 13th, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I can imagine my sweet husband booked a trip for us and I went, what do you mean you booked it over aging well? But the good news is you've got the A team that's going to be doing my role. So Courtney Hayes with our brand new baby is going to be the hostess for September. So we have to show all the love in the world to Courtney. So until then, I wanna thank you and be safe, stay cool and let's all age well. So thank you. <laughs>